But make sure that you're going over to bangthebook.com. We've got so much helpful content, lots of great resources over there, daily picks, preview articles for NHL, NBA, UFC. I wrote up my UFC 220 preview this morning. We've got golf, tennis, NASCAR. We'll have a lot of baseball stuff coming out soon. Still focused on the NFL, obviously. We'll have some more college football stuff as we go throughout the offseason. And then college basketball certainly in the spotlight now as well. So we cover all that over at bangthebook.com, where we are your one-stop shop for sports betting news and information. While you're over there, try out those free contests. You win cash prizes. Sign up with an email address. We'll shoot you a daily newsletter. That's all that we'll do with that. Check out our matchup data section as well. Give you the chance to break down the games with side-by-side statistical comparisons. There are some trends in there as well. Full season-to-date body of work stats. Lots of good stuff in that matchup data section. So make sure that you check that out. This and every edition of Bang the Book Radio presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. You sign up using that promo code BTV and the number 25. You'll get a $25 free bet just for signing up. 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook. 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino as well. At Bet DSI, it's only a game until you bet it. Two guests coming your way here on the program today. The first, Mr. Brian Leonard from wagertalk.com. Brian, how's it going today, man? Everything's going great. Glad to be here. Glad to have you on today's show. We're going to chat NFL and NBA on the program. But before we do that, I do want to ask you about this. You and I were talking about this a little bit off the air. Maybe it jogged your memory a little bit. Uh, but Steve Mickelson, who was the uh, the head odds maker at Atlanta Sportsbook up there in Reno, was the one that opened the Major League Baseball season win total market generally four or five days before it opened at the Superbook out there in Westgate. Uh, but he moved down to Vegas. Have you heard anything about you know if uh, if him and his sportsbook is going to open the market this year? You know I haven't, and since you brought it up, it's something I'll have to ask while I'm out today. Um, because I'm, I'm actually got on a strip today, so I'll, I'll figure out what's going on, and I'll probably have an answer for you for next week. But, yeah, I used to travel up to uh, up to Reno, and uh, it wasn't huge limits, but you were able to get into good numbers. And sometimes, you you know, three three wins off of the what the, the uh, market settles at. So if you do your work ahead of time, you could take advantage of it. But hats off to him when he was over there at, at Atlantis, and hats off to anybody who does come out with the first lines. And sure, there's a lot of... Uh, wise guy is waiting in line to bat him but the publicity you get is something that you don't usually get nationally i mean down at the gold nugget because of the things that they've done in the past you know when you come to vegas people don't think much of downtown but because of the work uh, tony miller's done over there at the gold nugget a lot of people know some of the things that he does and he goes out on a limb and uh, i don't know how to do profitable with it but it's great publicity for him I actually love the Nugget. I, I mean, I love going downtown in general. I mean, if, if you need to feel better about yourself, downtown's definitely the place to do it. But, I, I mean, I love the Golden Nugget. I love that little sports book that's there. When I was out there for my bachelor party last July, we uh, watched that Sunday night Indians-Tigers game there, and it was just – it's so laid back. It's – you know, there, there's no BS down there. It was uh, it was really great. And, you know, I mean, for those that are listening and are maybe planning a trip to Vegas this year, haven't been there before, go downtown. It, it is It is a blast. There's some really good places down there. Now, Pizza Rock's a really good one. Uh, but the Golden Nugget is a beautiful place. You know, you think of old Vegas and run down and the smell of stale smoke, and you'll get that at, you know, Fremont, Four Queens, those types of places. But Golden Nugget's really, really nice. It is really nice, and the people down there are really nice behind the counter. I've uh, made some nice friends over there. I, you know, it, it's nice to have some uh, guys behind the counter that will give you the the – different perspective of what you're getting. And, and I've always said I kind of wished I'd have spent a year or something working behind the counter and uh, in management and, and seeing how the other side works. But, yeah, it, you go up to any of those guys uh, work, working over there at the Nugget and ask them a question. They'll give you an honest answer. And, and I really like it down there. And now uh, the owner of the D is uh, from Detroit, and uh, he, the D is – being uh, renovated and the D is it used to be Fitzgerald's and now it's, it's so much nicer than it was before. It's really hip now. And now they bought uh, uh, the other casino across the street uh, over across from uh, gold, golden gate. And they tore that down. So the D is going to make another property there. So it's really being updated as of late. And I've always liked downtown anyway, because you get a better deal for your buck and you know, it, 
you get a full bottle of beer as opposed to a glass of beer is what they used to do down on the strip. And just they treat you a little bit better. And, the, and actually, the odds are a little bit better when you're looking at uh, the slot machines and things like that. And it's I, I love downtown. And like you said, it's it's got the rougher element because it is downtown. And just like any other city that has a downtown, you're going to get a whole bunch of people and, you know, people who don't have the ability to get out and uh, – to make some money, so you know you're going to deal with that. But you're going to deal with that any downtown of any city I've ever been in. Yeah, I'm going to choose my words very, very carefully in saying this. I like the D Casino. I like going in there. It's uh, you know, they got a long bar in there that's really, really nice. They got a cool mm-hmm. party pit. Also, the best bathrooms downtown as well. Um, you know, I've never come across a used needle like I did in Binion's at the D. So, you know, I think that's. Uh, just something for our listeners to consider as they do, uh, you know, plan some of their trips out here to Vegas. But uh, obviously we've gone on a little bit of a sidetrack there, but I, I would be interested in knowing, you know, if wherever Mickelson's working, I think it was a CG book. I could be wrong, but I'd be curious if they open. And it was, you mentioned they, they had decent limits. I think they were 500 bucks at, at Atlantis. And, you know, now that it's in Vegas, if he is the first to come out with the numbers, you know, should be able to get a little bit more down on those. So maybe that'll be something, that you could take full advantage of. And, and both of us, Brian and I, big time baseball guys, he goes to spring training every year. I got to make it out there one of these years, but you know, I know you and I are both uh, already in a baseball frame of mind. So I'm sure we'll have some notes to compare over the next couple of weeks, but let's take a look here at these conference championship games, beginning with the AFC conference championship. Jacksonville takes on new England really haven't seen a whole lot of movement here in this game. The eight, the eights and the eight and a halfs that were out there are gone. We're up to nine, nine and a half, mostly market wide. Uh, but still, I mean, not really anything significant here being between eight and 10 throughout the week. Yeah. I, it's basically in the teaser protection area, which, you, which would be the, uh, you know, teasing at six points down. If you have it at a nine, you tease into the key number. That's not going to help you any. So uh, the re- that's, I think that's the reason why the nines. I, I've seen the sharper books basically telling me, that uh, Jacksonville's taking more of the money here, the sharper money. And I've talked to a few wise guys out here that feel that way. And uh, I was on Jacksonville last week. It was a much better result than it was with Kansas City the week before. And a lot of it had to do with Pittsburgh. And, you know, Marco D'Angelo and I do videos for Wager Talk. He's from Pittsburgh. I'm from Cleveland. So we've always got that rivalry. And I, we were out the day before the game, and I said, what do you think about it? He goes, I'm a little bit nervous. I said, I would be nervous. And I said, if that uh, – because it was sitting at seven, seven and a half, and then it went down to seven a little bit. And I said, if that thing leaks at the sharper books down to six and a half, that's going to tell you before the game's even been played that Jacksonville's going to win this game, at least from the way I follow the line movements over the years. And sure enough, the Pinnacles and some of the other sharper books were starting to lean towards the six and a half. And all of a sudden, Jacksonville's got a quick lead, and uh, they end up winning that game straight up. A lot of the reason I liked it is because I've watched a lot of the Steelers games, and the Steelers have just been so inconsistent this year. Uh, we've seen them so many times when they played weak opposition and they played to that level. And uh, they were obviously looking past Jacksonville if you heard some of the quotes. But the Pittsburgh coaching staff has made terrible decisions all season long, and now they're going to guess the best – at least in my mind, one of the two best defenses in the NFL. And we talked about it last time they played Pittsburgh – uh, Pittsburgh played Jacksonville, and Pittsburgh continued to try to pass. They did it once again. And although they put some points on the board, that's not the way you attack this Jacksonville defense. Now they're going up against the New England offense, who likes to pass the ball. But New England throws the ball the, the way they set up their offense. Basically, they use the tight end, and they use the running backs, and they use it in the middle of the field. And that's actually the weakness of the Jacksonville pass defense they're better out on the corners, better back in the safeties, the longer passes. So I think New England's going to have a little bit of success there. And although I think the line is a little bit high, I do have concerns because, let's face it, this is the NFL. They haven't had good ratings this year. And I'm not going to say that there's any conspiracies out there, but if you watched New England play last week, they had every call of just about every play. And if you've watched the Patriots over the years, they tend to get more calls than anybody else. And now you've got a team. You've already got four teams from the East playing in this. You've already got the West Coast really more disinterested in this. Well, you've got Minnesota and you've got Jacksonville. Now, if Minnesota happens to play Jacksonville in the Super Bowl, smaller cities, uh, Minnesota, 
not a very populous state. It's going to be really strange how this works out. So uh, New England's gotten all the calls. It's favorable to the NFL, obviously, if New England makes the Super Bowl. So you're always looking at that when you're handicapping this game. And I'm not going to say it's going to happen, but how many times have we seen New England get the calls over the years? So you're going to, even though Jacksonville, the line's a little bit favorable, in my opinion, I think I'm going to lay off the game because of that. No, I mean, I think that makes sense. And interestingly enough, you're not the first person to talk about that here on the show this week. That's something Brian Blessing mentioned yesterday in our first segment. And if listeners missed that, a lot of shelf life to that one because we talked about these two games and then also the NHL. So make sure that you check that out. But, you know, I agree with you that you've got teaser protection out there that has led to maybe a little bit of an inflated line. You also have – what's interesting to me is that you've got New England coming off of a very methodical New England type of win, 34-14 to or 35-14. to It was a 35-7 game. Titans scored that late touchdown. It really wasn't anything surprising. It wasn't earth-shattering. You know, it didn't catch us off guard at all. Jacksonville not only winning – but winning that game 45-42 to 42 caught us off, off guard a little bit. So I'm kind of curious to see, you know, how that dynamic plays out as we get later into the week, as we get more public investment on this game. And as we know, sharp betters have been waiting it out a little bit more this season. Lots of game day moves of significance on sharp sides. So what do you think happens with this number, Brian? I mean, do you think that it does come down because you've got straight wagers on Jacksonville to the point where the books aren't as worried about those New England teasers? I don't know. We'll have to see. I know this is going to be a pros versus Joe's game. Uh, the Joe's are going to be all over New England, and why Why wouldn't they? I mean, it's amazing to me how New England over the last decade has done against the spread despite being such a public team. That We're going to look at this decades from now and say, how the hell did that happen? Because that's a team that covers no matter what the spread is, and the public knows it and gives the public all the credit in the world because the wise guys – continue to try to beat their head against the wall against with the Patriots, and they continue to get beat. So uh, we'll, we'll have to see here. But, uh, you know, it's – we'll have to see how the game goes. But I, I like Jacksonville's chances as long as the game is on the up and up. And to be totally honest with the offense that they've played lately, it's because Bortles is getting on to running. Every week he's getting more confidence in the running game, and he's – you know, that's any time you've got a mobile quarterback, that's something the defense has to look at. So any time he's going to run, there'll be more chances for him to throw the ball downfield. And for the most part, he has he's had a lot of success running, but he's really not known as a running quarterback. You've got your Will Sids and some of the other guys that are known for that, but he's been very good in his career doing that, and he's getting more and more confidence every week. So. Uh, until somebody can stop him, you know, the Jacksonville offense is a lot different with him moving the football with his legs than it was earlier in the season. And as I mentioned on yesterday's show, Jacksonville six for six in the red zone scoring touchdowns so far in these playoffs, top five in the regular season in, ter- in terms of red zone touchdown efficiency. New England was very good at defending the red zone, so that may end up being the deciding factor in this game. Does Jacksonville get three or do they get seven? And if they get three too many times, we know what Tom Brady is capable of doing. So, you know, in that respect, maybe a little bit higher variance of a game because I think Jacksonville can move the football, but the manner in which they cash in those opportunities, you know, probably does end up dictating how this game plays out. Uh, let's move on to the NFC championship game here. Minnesota takes on Philadelphia. This number was three and a half early in the week, three and a half through yesterday's show. Now the sharp money has shown up and it is on the Philadelphia Eagles. Definitely is, and if you look at Pinnacle, they're three minus one ten. Everybody else is about three minus fifteen, uh, twenty. So the money is coming in at the sharper books at uh, at Philadelphia, and it makes a lot of sense. I, I had the Eagles last week, and and uh, I'll, I'll be on them again this week. Uh, Minnesota, it, it's it's really fascinating because last week you saw a dull team in Atlanta, and. Uh, they go on the road to a team playing outside and they lose that game at Philadelphia. <clears throat> and then once again, this week we see another dull team going on the road, the same price range, basically. Um, and a lot of people have said that Minnesota's played better on the road since they built this new stadium, as opposed to where they were in the Metrodome. But still, it's a small sample size. If you take a look at the teams they played on the road this year, they had a lot of bad teams they beat on the road. They beat the Browns in London. 
Uh, they beat Chicago on the road. They beat Green Bay on the road. Their road victories were against bad football teams. But when they did play good football teams on the road, they didn't fare nearly as well. And now they are playing a good football team at Philadelphia. And granted, Philadelphia's quarterback is up there, and, and the, but the backup has been decent. He played a little bit better last week. And, you know, I was pretty impressed by how Philadelphia really liked that underdog role. And, and I really liked him in that game. So, um a lot of people are going to talk about uh, their improvement, Minnesota's improvement on the road. But still, anytime you've got a dome team playing a team, especially the cold weather, although I think this game at Philadelphia is not going to be so bad from the weather standpoint. But keep in mind over the years how bad those dome teams have played outdoors in the playoffs. And uh, that's a big advantage. And to get that team as a home underdog, the three and a half was a no-brainer, and I can see why it's gone. But at three, it wouldn't surprise me if we see see it even dropping even further. Well, of course, we saw Philadelphia go to two and a half last week for a short time against Atlanta. Then we saw a little bit of public buyback, maybe a little bit of sharp buyback, trying to middle that number as well with Philadelphia, you know, plus the three and a half, and then Atlanta minus the two and a half. A little bit of arbitrage there, looking to middle on the key number of three. So it wouldn't shock me, honestly, if this game does the same thing, where you've got some sharp investment, at the plus three and a half, you come back on Minnesota minus two and a half if we get one. Now, there's no certainty that we will, but the line certainly is trending that way here. It is only Wednesday. This is the late game on Sunday, so we're going to have a ton of involvement, a ton of action, both sharp and public on this one. I think what's challenging is that you've got two teams that are very, very similar. Pat Shermer from the Andy Reid coaching tree, obviously Doug Peterson from the Andy Reid coaching tree, both very, very stout defenses. Minnesota maybe a little bit higher upside of a defense in terms of, you know, explosive defensive plays like, uh, you know, the, the big turnovers. But Philadelphia gets a lot of pressure with the front four, tackles very well in the back seven. So this is a game where I think the under is probably the best way to look with a total of 38, 38 and a half, though. You know, it's a, it's a very low number with not a whole lot of margin for error. Yeah, it's tough playing those holes that are that low, and especially when there's turnovers involved and, uh, you know, two decent quarterbacks, but not two. You know, you're not going to see Tom Brady throwing a lot of interceptions in a playoff game. And uh, when you've got a, a player of that capability, you don't have to worry about pick sixes and things like that as very often. But when you're playing a low total and you've got quarterbacks that are, let's just say, they're not the elite quarterbacks, you can find some uh, some changes there from the defense. So you might be able to give up some defensive points. What's really interesting is the difference in home fields between these two teams. Um, these two fought all season long for home field advantage. If Minnesota would have gotten home field, that would have said they had the home field all the way through the playoffs and then the playing the Super Bowl at home there. And that's the chances of them winning the Super Bowl in that regard would have been higher. And just think if, if that game, if Minnesota had had the, uh, the home field advantage, which was still up in the air until the last week or two, uh, this line would be over a touchdown. We're probably looking at about eight here. So Minnesota playing at home, laying eight, or playing on the road, laying three. Um, I, I, th- I would rather prefer them going on the road, laying the three, and taking Philadelphia here as opposed to Philadelphia have to go on the road and play in the Dome against Minnesota. So even though the points would be five, five, six points differential, uh, I think the Philadelphia spot playing at home, I like them much better at, at home than if they would have had to go to Minnesota for this game. Last thing here on these two NFL games, Minnesota, Philadelphia, barring injury, you're going to have one of Case Keenum or and Nick Fol- one of Case Keenum or Nick Foles in the Super Bowl. And if we get that New England upset, which I don't think is going to happen, but it, you know, I mean, obviously it could. Bortles in the Super Bowl against either Case <laughs> Keenum or Nick Foles. <laughs> My, how times have changed. Yeah, that's well. You think back and you see some of the guys that have won the Super Bowls. I remember Williams for Washington years ago, uh, the Seattle quarterback that's now uh, an announcer on the on ESPN. But you'll you'll find it, but uh, it doesn't happen very often. And I I kind of like that. It is, I'm tired of the same teams it's winning all the time. And you know that's why part of me was pulling for Pittsburgh to lose, and part of it was I'm a Browns fan, but. I, I wouldn't mind seeing New England lose. I'm tired of the same teams winning all the time. I'm a Cavaliers fan, and I could see how everybody else in the Eastern Conference wants the Cavaliers to lose. I, I think it's uh, it's good for the game to have some new blood in there once in a while. And 
So, you know, from the NFC standpoint, I'm, I'm fine with either team being in there. But if Jacksonville can make it, I'm actually going to be pretty happy unless I have a bet on New England in this game. See, I, I, the hard part for me is this. I mean, I, I'm not a live in the present, live in the moment kind of person. I mean, I just, I, I never have been. I'm always thinking multiple steps ahead. And I find myself thinking if we get Jacksonville versus Philadelphia or, or even Jacksonville versus Minnesota, from a prop betting standpoint, that is a really, really difficult game because you've got this elite level Jacksonville defense with a couple weeks to prepare, but you also have Blake Bortles and you, you don't know what you're going to get from Blake Bortles. Leonard Fournette was really good last week and was not good through the second half of the regular season. So what are you going to get from him? Minnesota with Case Keenum. Now he made some really bad throws last week against the Saints. If he does the same thing here against the Eagles, what do you expect from him in the Super Bowl against arguably the best defense in the NFL this year and certainly the best defense against the pass? Same thing with Nick Foles. So, you know, for me, I, I think I kind of like the idea of a little bit more certainty with New England being there from a betting standpoint. But also, you know, I think that odds makers as well will have the same reservations and questions about Blake Bortles or Nick Foles or Case Keenum that, you know, there may be some significant prop betting value out there because you just don't know what to expect. Yeah, uh, I'm, w- I'm with you. And it's sort of like, like, to me, a game is a game. And if it's on TV or not on TV, I don't care. I'm handicapping the game. And, you know, most guys are looking to play the games that are on TV and, like when uh, when they just had the national championship, we had two teams from the SEC. You know, I heard people say, oh, I'm not going to bet that game. I'm not going to watch that game. I don't want to see that. We see that in the regular seasons. And, you know, to me, a game is a game. And, sure, I didn't want to see it either. I'd rather have some other teams in there, although uh, Georgia being in there was different. But um, it, it's I treat everything, regardless if it's on TV or not, or what time, what kind of game it is, if it's, if it's the worst teams in the NFL playing as opposed to the best teams, I don't care. I'm handicapping the game that way. And so it makes no difference to me. And half the games, you know, I don't have time to watch them. Uh, of course, we all get together for the Super Bowl and somebody watches, you know, we always watch the Super Bowl, whether it's live or, or delayed or you tape it or whatever happens. But uh, to me, it'll be interesting. Like, as you said about the props, um, I mean, maybe there's more props built into turnovers. <laughs> and how game, how turnovers uh, are going to affect the game. Uh, but we'll have to see. And uh, normally you get a lot of betting on the, the – the Super Bowl is really easy to bet because you get the high-profile players, your quarterbacks. As soon as the lines come out, you bet the over and, and anything you can get on like a Tom Brady or something, knowing everybody else is going to bet it too, and then you can just come back later on and set yourself up for middles. I don't know if you'll see that, as you pointed out, with uh, the key players in this because obviously – you know, the four and at with the injuries. So how can you trust the the key running back and, and things like that? And then obviously with the quarterbacks uh, having shaky histories, it will be interesting. All right, let's, let, let's uh, transition over to the NBA here for a few minutes. And I, I left this choice up to you if you wanted to talk NBA, college basketball, or the NHL for the second part of today's segment. You opted for the NBA, and you wanted to specifically focus on the Cleveland Cavaliers, who are the worst team against the spread They're basically the anti-New England Patriots in that, uh, you know, they just can't seem to cover no matter what number you put up there for them. Uh, What stands out about the Cavs right now? Oh, boy, what a mess. Um, As as I'm sure you do, you pay special attention, being from Cleveland. I watch every Cavaliers game, and there's been times where I've been frustrated over the years. At this point, I think the players are overly frustrated, and and you could tell by LeBron's actions. Uh, before they lost, when they lost to Boston, and the first time he left, you could tell his heart wasn't in it. He'd given up. I tell you, looking at him play, he's still a terrific player, great player, but just some of the actions, he, he doesn't get back on defense. Uh, he complains all the time. He's always complaining to the rest, which he's always done. Uh, I have serious concerns about this team going forward. Uh, you watch Isaiah Thomas play. He came back too soon in my my regard. All of his shots are short. Um, he's still very quick and get to the basket, but he he hasn't played that long with LeBron in the lineup. And and but his all of his shots are short, which tells me he doesn't have his legs yet. And when I'm betting against Cleveland, I want Isaiah Thomas to shoot the ball every time he touches the ball. And how many people have been able to say that the way he's played the last few years? Uh, this team's defense is horrendous. You watched him against Golden State, and I played him 
I played Golden State in game, and that was probably the one of the easier bets I've ever made because you could tell it, Golden State was at the hoop on every single drive, and they were missing bunnies all day long. Cleveland just has no inside presence, and there, there's been talk about you know making some trades and bringing those guys in. I, I don't think it's going to matter. This this team right now, they've got great shooters, uh, great offensive players, but they just don't have the defense. And, and LeBron, when he wants to play defense, he's just a terrific defensive player. Problem is, there's not enough other guys on this team. And Thompson, you know, we jo- you joke all the time when he started getting involved with the Kardashians. He's turning into any person that a Kardashian has dated in an athlete because he's just not the same player as he was before doesn't have that hunger, and uh, it's I, – I, I, there's no way I'm playing this Cleveland team. And, and you touched on when they're playing Orlando uh, coming up tomorrow, and they are at home. They're going to give a big number. But keep in mind that, uh, you know, they haven't played well against Orlando. Both times they played Orlando, which right off, I believe, Boston, or they just played Golden State. So they're coming off a big game before they play Orlando. This will be the third time. Um, they've split so far with Orlando, and when they played in Orlando, I believe they only won one by four, didn't come close to covering. So just because they're playing a weak team does not mean you want to bet the Cavaliers. And to be totally honest with you, that's the last time, well, that's the way I want the, the play the Cavaliers this year because they try to get up for the good teams and they just have not gotten up for the bad teams. Just because they lost to Golden State the other day does not mean they're going to all of a sudden right the ship here against uh, the Magic. I don't care where they're playing. Um, the magic plus the points will be on my card. No, and, and I mean, the problems aren't really deep with this team. I mean, LeBron obviously didn't like David Blatt. He got canned. They go to Tyron Lou. Tyron Lou kind of lets them sort of do their own thing. They picked up the pace a little bit. They started having more fun playing the game. Now, all of a sudden, the formula is not really working. And I don't know if it's a chemistry thing. I don't know if it's the frustration of not, you know, playing at the level that they're accustomed to. I don't know if it's just simply... LeBron may be gassed. I mean, this is a guy who's, you know, in his age 33 season, playing 37 minutes a game, led the league in minutes played per game last year, which is just outlandish when you consider what the Cavs have at stake at the end of the season. I mean, the regular season is, is largely irrelevant to them, and it's largely irrelevant to several NBA teams that are out there. To have LeBron leading the league in minutes played is just asinine to me. But, you know, this is a team that has a lot of issues, and, you know, Here's the thing for me. I'm going to respectfully disagree with you about tomorrow's game. If they don't cover, I think it's because they have, you know, all these issues that are going on and, you know, they have, maybe there's some infighting. I know a lot of the players voiced off the record after the Warriors game to the media, you know, they don't love the way the roster is constructed. They don't love the way that this team has been put together. I mean, you've got, you know, Derek Rose is hurt, but you've got these veteran guys used to playing big roles like a Dwayne Wade coming off the bench and, and kudos to Wade for doing that. But also, you know, when things aren't working, something needs to change. And I don't know if that means putting Wade in the starting lineup. I don't know necessarily what that means. J.R. Smith, you know, couldn't hit water if he fell out of a boat right now. So they have a lot of issues. And and typically, you know, I would look to completely avoid them or bet against them in games like this where they're playing a nobody, a team that they're not going to get excited about playing, especially coming off of that Warriors game. Plus, I think they play Oklahoma City this weekend. So it's a really, really bad spot for them. But – everyone's talking about all the problems that they have here. And, you know, there are a lot of veteran guys, a lot of high character guys in that locker room. Plus when they played Orlando last time, they gave up 127 points. Now they won 131, 127, as you mentioned, that's embarrassing to give up 127 points to the magic. I know the Cavs can't defend, but I sort of feel like this is one of those rare spots where they do actually step up and blow out a really inferior opponent. But You know, again, it's all market dependent on what the number is. And, you know, I do agree with your concerns. I just sort of feel like, you know, maybe they look good here and everyone kind of goes, oh, okay. And then when they play Oklahoma City or, you know, somebody else with some upside and some talent, they kind of revert back to what they've been. Uh, You mentioned J.R. Smith, and he's one of those guys that is by LeBron's side. They're really good friends. And you could just see that J.R. Smith just does not have that same excitement to play this year, and, and it's been that way through his entire career when he was in New York. When he wanted to play, he was really good. When he didn't, he, he, he nobody wanted him on the team. This year is very similar to that. He's, he's just not playing well. And, you know, other than I think Dwayne Wade 
is doing an outstanding job based on his age and what he's asked to do here. And Corver is another guy that I think should get more minutes, but, you know, he's not very good defensively. But most of the other players on this team, and even Kevin Love lately, Kevin, Kevin Love is just not playing with the same intensity he's done before. They've all been disappointments. And to, to have Cleveland with the record they have and to have all these guys that have been disappointments this year suffer, I guess, LeBron because he's up for the MVP uh, voting. But to still have this record, it's still pretty good. Problem is we've seen no signs that this is the team that can uh, challenge Golden State. And right now I've got Cleveland fourth in my power ratings in the, in the East. And ever since LeBron's been there, that's the, by far the lowest I've had him. All right, let's talk about a couple of games here on Wednesday night that I want to hit on real quickly. And the the first one being New Orleans and Atlanta. And you've got New Orleans, a two, two and a half point favorite here on the road against the Hawks. This is a back-to-back. New Orleans blew a fourth quarter lead yesterday, wound up prevailing in overtime by three as a five and a half point dog. Tough spot for Boston. They're coming back off the London game. They've only played one game in the last 10 days. So, you know, it was a, a tricky little situation for them. Not surprising to see the market come in here against New Orleans with that back-to-back off the overtime game. It's almost an autoplay for some of the people that grab the overnights out there. But, Brian, as I look at this number being New Orleans minus three and a half, it feels to me like the spot was already built into the line. So do you think the odds makers are, are just, you know, are rating that a little bit more accurately and, and maybe the value in finding those situational spots is gone? No, you can still find them. It's just you got to jump on them before everybody else does. And you take a look at New Orleans yesterday, as you mentioned, a lot of minutes played by the big, big guys. You know, were forty minutes played by, by both their, uh, the big guys. They had the best, two best players, forty-two and forty-seven, I believe. But they only played eight players yesterday. So you've got a lineup where you don't have a lot of depth. And now they're playing, you know, they played last night. This is their, uh, I believe this is their third game of, uh, of the road trip. They played at New York and then they played Boston and now they play Atlanta. And then they go home for a couple of games. This is definitely a letdown situation for New Orleans here. Uh, they go back home and play Memphis and Chicago. I like to play teams that are playing non-conference games in this situation because as we talked in the past about the NFL, um, it's more important to beat your divisional rivals, more important to beat the teams you're going to play in the playoffs, and then the teams that are not going to be in the playoffs in, in the opposite uh, conference are the teams that you see teams slip up on. And, and uh, I, you know, Atlanta's not a good team by any imagination, but they're playing this New Orleans team here that just, as you mentioned, just played that game against Boston and uh, played a lot of minutes from the big guys, and both those guys have had injury concerns in the past, especially Davis. And uh, so you're getting them coming in here uh, unrested to play Atlanta as a road favorite. Um, I think it's, it's legitimate that Atlanta's got a uh, good chance to win this game. Uh, there's a, a good possibility I will be on the Hawks in this contest. All right, how about game 709-710 here between Miami and Milwaukee? And this will be what we wrap up the segment with. Milwaukee up from a four-point favorite to a four-and-a-half-point favorite. This is a really interesting game, as I outlined to you in, uh, in the show notes I sent over today. Tenth game in 17 days for Milwaukee. This will be their tenth game in 2018, four at home, five on the road. This one they return home after a quick little two-game trip where they played Miami on Sunday and lost by 18, only scored 79 points in that game, then played at Washington on Monday night, rallied for a nice win there over the Wizards. So, I sort of like to refer to this as the rapid revenge theory, where I kind of look at a spot like this and say, okay, you know, Milwaukee got embarrassed in Miami. And look, playing in Miami is not easy. And when you have a Saturday night off in South Beach, it's really not easy to play the next day. So for the Bucks here, I mean, I think this spot sets up really, really nicely for them. What do you think? I'm kind of against you on this one. Um, I took a look at the way the Bucks schedule is lined up. Uh, they played Minnesota, Oklahoma City, Toronto, Indiana, Toronto, Washington, Indiana. They did get to play Orlando, and they win that game by seven at home. Then they have Golden State, Miami, Washington, and Miami again with Philadelphia on deck. So that's, I believe, 11 of 12 or 12 of 13 against playoff type of teams. And they, as you mentioned, they just played Milwaukee, or excuse me, they just played Miami. But I had these teams virtually equal, and uh, you've got a Miami team who just played there. But Miami's been excellent 
off of a loss this year. They're twelve and five straight up off of a loss, and uh, the last time I lost a game was Miami. I had Miami against Chicago, and, I, and I've won every other day this week except for that one. But I think Miami comes back here, and uh, it, Milwaukee's a lot, one of those younger teams that has a lot of talent. And I always find that a lot of people like to bet them because they got a lot of they make a lot of great plays. It's sort of like the Lakers; they got a lot of physical abilities. They're they're really athletic, but yet when it comes down to it, they're not a great point spread team. I, I like the players on the young players on Milwaukee. But if the game's coming down to the wire, I'd rather have the veteran Miami team with the coach there that's, to me, the last year and a half, he's gotten so much out of that Miami team and without having the superstars like he had before. And uh, I lost to Miami the other day, but I'll be back on him again today. Brian Leonard from wagertalk.com. What's going on over at the website right now, Brian? Yeah, it's an exciting day. Uh, we're going to do videos today. We've got some outsiders. We like to uh, – give a lot of people that are in our industry that don't get a lot of pub or people that uh, work for competing companies to come in and, and talk sports. And we do that on our videos with going in today and having that done. Uh, one of them will be uh, Kelly in Vegas. And uh, obviously if you followed the industry, she's well known. She's a, she's a real nice girl in Vegas. There's not too many women that handicap sports out here in Las Vegas. So, uh, and plus she's, she's easy on the eyes. She's really a nice person. Uh, but she'll be in there and uh, some of the guys we've worked with in the past. And uh, it should be interesting today when we do videos and uh, those will all be up. We'll talk football. We'll talk general betting. Uh, there might be some basketball talk on there, but it, it's always worth looking into. Uh, got a group, great group of guys over there, just as you have it in your website. And uh, we like to put out as much good information as possible that, that people can make some money. And, and that's our goal. Now, of course, you can follow Brian on Twitter at B Leonard Sports. Brian Leonard, wagertalk.com. Appreciate your time here today, sir. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you. Take care, everyone.